um, how how do you what what should the rules for that debate be? What should the evidence for settling it be? Because if the prime minister kind of feels like it's the right thing to do, that's a bit hard to argue with. The people that you know quickly fired up on the Facebook page, they really feel it too. How? Uh, I don't know if you, it might be a cruel question to ask, but as a democracy, if war's about whether you feel it's right or wrong, how would we ever know? Um, I don't know, but I do think we need to take some responsibility for um, debating these things ourselves. Uh, you know, I, I go back to the beginning and I, and I note that, um, that government and opposition were as one on, on this issue in terms of the deployment and there wasn't, in the, in the oh, one of these phrases, in the public space, there wasn't a great deal of, um, of debate, uh, of dissent at the time, not that got sort of above above the noise of agreement. Now, maybe that's the fault of the media not reporting it. Um, I can't I can't remember at the, back to the, the time whether uh, whether there were distinct voices raised against it or not. I know that now, I think you see um, difference in the wake of, in the last 12 months, we've seen the debate emerge um, for a couple of reasons. I think, interesting, and I talk in the book about this, Julia Gillard um, said this to me, she can pinpoint the moment where she thinks public opinion turned. She, through the course of the last election campaign, I don't know if you remember last year, there were a series of um, Australian deaths in Afghanistan. There were two soldiers killed in one incident. And then there was another one, I think it was Lance Corporal Jared McKinney, who was killed. And they have, have a news conference at, at every time and, and make this announcement. And Julia Gillard said to me, yeah, she made this announcement with John Faulkner, who was then the minister at the end of this election campaign. And the questions in that, camp, in that news conference changed. Normally at these conferences, the journalists would say, can you tell us about the incident? What can you tell us about the soldier? You know, it's all about that incident and, and the deployment in that sense. But this time people started saying, why are we there? Should we still be there? Isn't this enough? And she, she walked out of that news conference and she said to John Faulkner, that was the moment when the public debate, in terms of the media's interpretation of it anyway, changed. I also think because of the result we got at the last election, the Greens have um, a greater influence now in public debate because they've got, they get more airtime and they are the one party that have, that are, have a dissenting view. So their views are getting more a currency, I suppose, so we are seeing a greater debate. I, get, I think the point I'm making is that, that we probably should debate these things back at the beginning and yes, if, if a Prime Minister decides we don't need to have a debate, it's kind of tough to do it. Um, and I don't know how, if the media aren't reporting that, you inject yourself into it. But I do think that we all have a responsibility to think about the decisions that our governments are making on our behalf. And if we don't like them, we should say so. Um, we don't tend to vote about wars. We vote about we vote from the hip pocket naturally always, and we don't vote based on a war. You know, there was a lot of dis dissent. Um, there was public demonstrations about Iraq, and that didn't didn't affect their, their point of view, but at least I guess it was on the record that people opposed it. And I know it, did, it didn't It did affect their commitment, but it did affect John Howe's thinking and he was very, very conscious about it. And as a consequence, um, I think the deployment we saw in Iraq was very small target. They did go in early, they did the pointy end thing, but um, when they stayed, they were moved to an area of, of Iraq where nothing was really happening. The soldiers were bored rigid and they, it created quite a lot of tension between them and the Americans at the military level because the Americans felt that we weren't doing anything. But I think the, um, the idea was uh, not many dead, in fact none in terms of the a active operations. One soldier was killed in his barracks, but other than that, they got in and they got out without casualties. Now, I do think that was a direct response to the fact that Australians protested and John Howard knew that they didn't like it. But there wasn't that same level of public protest about Afghanistan because it was a creeping creeping conflict. In fact, when I got sent there in 2007, I was disappointed I wasn't going to Iraq. I thought I was going to the boring war um, in Afghanistan, you know, because all the attention was on Iraq, all the controversy was about Iraq. And I think we probably have a responsibility to make our voices heard and our views heard, whatever they may be, um, so that they're on the public record and, and hopefully they affect our decision makers. I don't know if that's... Yes. In front. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Hope you have a quick recovery. Thank you, yeah. um, I wore it to see the Queen on the Friday. <laughs> I didn't get to shake her hand, I wasn't quick enough, unfortunately. <laughs> two quick, well, two questions. Um, when you did your research and writing of your book, what were the biggest surprises, things that surprised you most as you did your research and your discovery? And the second question is, 
as you're talking to the soldiers and hearing some of the stories and seeing some of the results for yourself, why are we not hearing about the results, the numbers of schools built, the numbers of students educated, whether it's from the politicians or from the media itself? Mm. Sharon, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the first part of it was what surprised me most during the research of, for the book. And the second part was, why do we not hear so much about the building of the schools, the educating of the kids, the sorts of things that might be described as progress? Well, it, I'll take the second part first. Interestingly, you know, that was something that frustrated me. I was sick to death of hearing people say, we're making progress. It became one of those words that would make the hair stand up on the back of my neck, because what is progress? So I was very privileged to go and at least have a look. Um, we were there during Ramadan, and we, you know, we went to one tiny corner of one province, so, you know, I, I don't profess to have a first-hand knowledge of anything beyond that. Um, there was a girls' school that had been opened, in fact that's the one story I hadn't got to air and I'm still hoping to, there was a girls' school that's been opened in, in Tarancot which seems to be going quite well. Because it was Ramadan, they were on holidays, so we didn't get to see the kids. Um, we did get to speak to some of the teachers and it's, it's clear that there is um, still di division in the community about whether girls should be educated or not and it's, it's one of those um, cultural challenges, I suppose, uh, for those engaging in um, civilian aid and development work, that they may be going in thinking what this country needs is educated girls, and there are some people who are devout Muslims who believe that, um, that that's not what they need and they don't want their daughters to go to school. I had a conversation, amazing conversation, in a village called Kala Kala in the Baluchi Valley, um, which the Ozo people had helped arrange for me. We sat down with the tribal elder whose name is Mullah Dad, who's a man with not many front teeth and a big turban, and he wore his gun belt, bullet belt around his neck as a necklace. Uh, he called all the tribal elders together and we sat down and had a, quite an amazing conversation, all men and boys, and, and all men with us except for me, um, about hopes and dreams and aspirations. And he was saying, you know, we want our kids to go to school and we want to develop our community, we want to build a bazaar and we want all these things. And when I said, you, you know, when you say your children, your sons and your daughters. And he sort of said yes, but in the end his answer really was um, more his sons and his daughters to, to be performing the role, a traditional role in their village that women perform. So, um, you know, I think there's division in the community about those kinds of things. I got to go there and therefore I could report on some of that and the trouble is we don't get to go there and report on it firsthand very much. Um, I think probably the civilian dimensions of the commitment over there haven't done as much to promote their activities as the Defence Force has and is starting to do, and that's because it's, it's come much later as well. And without people being there, especially in television, if you're not there and you haven't got pictures of it, it's quite difficult to persuade people to report on it. So I think it's a good thing that Defence is, is now assisting some of us to go. Whatever that you think of the compromise, I take the view that it's better to go and have a look and you need to bear in mind when you go that you are in a compromised situation. Um, but at least you get to go and you, you can make a judgment about that sort of progress. Um, there's, you know, there are schools built in, in Chora Valley, in, in Chora Town, that I went to, um, a boys' school and a girls' school. And I, was, um, I felt it was sad that I was there at Ramadan and couldn't see them functioning. But they are there. Um, in terms of surprises, I think it was more the sort of confirmation of things that I knew, like the degree of politicking that goes on inside a war. Um, right down to the ground level. And also the influence of individuals. You sort of know that in government anyway, but it became very clear to me that individual personalities and individual relationships have a very big influence on the course of events. Um, John Howard and Alexander Downer's relationship was very important. John Howard's relationship with George Bush became very important. I, I, I tell some slightly mischievous stories in the book about, um, you know, John Howard has always talked about that 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 relationship was forged on September 11 and but in fact um, it, it became clear to me through researching and through reading other books including the one that Bob Woodward wrote in within a year of um, of the uh, September 11 that that George Bush was not as focused on the fact that John Howard had been there as John Howard was <laughs> and, and in fact Bob Woodward asked um, interviewed Bush about uh, the the days leading up to September 11 and the uh, knowledge of Al-Qaeda and how much there'd been discussion about, and there, there was due to have been a briefing, brief presented to the President on September 10 about Al-Qaeda, and 
the president said, well, I couldn't have been briefed on September 10 because I was in Florida on September 10. Well, in fact, he was in Washington for the first half. He met John Howard for the first time <laughs> at the Navy Yard for the 50th anniversary of ANZUS, hosted him at the White House, had talks and lunch, and then went to Florida. And I thought it was interesting that it didn't... It just it didn't come front of mind. It was I wasn't in Washington. Yes, Mr. President, you were. <laughs> so I think that shows you. I mean, it's a small example, and maybe it's it's a slightly naughty one from my point of view. But I, I think the president was not as focused on that. I think the relationship was forged over Iraq, because that's when the president really needed us, and that's when he needed John Howard. And they they did become close through the Australian deployment at the beginning, and Australia acquitted itself well militarily in that first deployment, and its soldiers are highly regarded, especially special forces, for what they can do. So it, it, it proved itself a good ally, and that forged a stronger relationship. And my view is it was Iraq. And so I, I was kind of sort of slightly galled and surprised at the, at, at the way that individuals do influence um, the, the, the course of events. And, and the same now, I mean, Kevin Rudd had quite strong ideas as Prime Minister about how, um, what our deployment should look like. He um, he decided that we needed to restrict the movement of forces or, or more greatly enforce the movement of our forces to within within the boundaries of a rules garden province and people talk some give it greater weight than others about a red line that they effectively drew around a rules garden and said you know this is where we're working and that's because that was all about getting us out and and you know we our mission now is train the train the the Kandak in a rules garden to a certain level and be able to withdraw and if we're going to train those people in a rules gun, we're going to stay in a rules gun, and we're not going to go wandering off to other operations. And that caused some some tensions, but that was very much um, Kevin Rudd and his minister's view. So different personalities do affect the way these things come about. And um, I suppose I, that's what I went looking for. I went looking for the role of people, and the, and that's what I found, and I thought it was, was quite interesting. Um, we're time for, there's a few hands going up. Time for a couple of questions. Sorry, I'm I, being long-winded. I have to make it. I have to make an observation, though. Um, Robert McNamara, a fantastic documentary, *The Fog of War*. If you haven't seen it, you should. Yeah. It's a fantastic bit in there where Robert McNamara talks about the Vietnam War, and the whole thing is pointing his finger down. There's not one of our allies would join us in Vietnam. Not one. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Yes. So. Well, the other thing, just before we go on quickly, the other thing that was interesting to me was that John Howard insisted on um, on a request from George Bush. You know, even though we said we want to go to Afghanistan, he he insisted on a request, even if it was just a phone call. And the Americans didn't want to issue a request because they don't always want all their allies to come. Some allies are more trouble than they're worth um, because countries fight under different rules of engagement. And this is the sort of thing I haven't really focused on before as a non-military person. Different rules of engagement, different levels of training, different languages. It means that soldiers don't always work well together. And sometimes if you've got a country whose soldiers are not trained as well as yours, who have different rules, some of them can't fight at night, for example. Some of them aren't allowed to use certain equipment. Um, so they didn't want all the allies, and they didn't want to issue a request to someone and then have to issue it to everyone, and then have all these allies they didn't want, who wanted to be seen to be flying a flag with the US. But John Howard insisted on it, and in the end he got a phone call from Bush. And, and Bush didn't even, in the call, he didn't actually say, John, I really want your forces to come. He said, uh, words to the effect of, well, John, um, you know, I think we've agreed and, you know, you're, the, our militaries can sort it out. And Howard was able to go out and say, I've had a phone call from the President of the United States and we've received this request and now we're going. And when I said to him, and what was that about? He said, oh, well, Karen, it's my solicitor's training. I always like a paper trail. Um, <laughs> he, he liked to be able to say that. And it goes back to Vietnam because um, when uh, we committed to Vietnam, that was done without a request. And uh, the Prime Minister got up in Parliament and, and made out that he had a request from South Vietnam, made out that he had a request from the Americans, and had neither. He had some bits of paper, but they weren't, they weren't that. And I think John Howard now says he was also mindful of that, and he didn't want to get caught in that kind of quagmire um, for not having had the formal request. So a phone call, he was at a fundraising dinner at some restaurant in Sydney, took, took the call from the President and was able to go out and say, yep, yeah, we're on our way, we've had the call, we're being, we're being asked to go. Sorry, oh, yeah. over here. Yeah. Um, just follows a bit from the other question. I, I wonder whether you think that we should have gone in with builders and teachers and solar power experts instead of soldiers. And also, given that we keep getting hooked up in these US conflicts with no exit strategy, what would you think would be an exit strategy for Afghanistan? That's a great question. I reckon I could make a lot of money if I had an answer for that. Um, I think there was an attack on the United States 
and the United States had to respond and it's a question of how and whether they responded in the best possible way.